Welcome to our session. The session is titled Changemakers in Interdisciplinary Learning, Alumni Reflect on Ecology and Photography, an Interdisciplinary Course. I'm pleased to moderate this. My name is Daniel Benkendorf. I'm an Associate Professor of Psychology here at FIT, and I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves, and I'll start with Professor Keith Ellenbogen. Hi, all, and welcome. My name is Keith Ellenbogen. I'm an Associate Professor of Photography here at SUNY FIT. And uh, my work really focuses on uh, um, environmental photography and conservation, really mostly in the marine environment and sort of raising visibility about life beneath our oceans, our rivers, our lakes, and raising their profile so that we can understand the impact that the wildlife has on us. Uh, and I've been working with Artie and these students over the last uh, few years while we they had a class together, and uh, we'd like to share some of the images and stories that have uh, been a result of this. And pass it over to RD now. Thank you, Keith, and and thanks um, everyone involved in this. So Thank my name is is uh, Artie Kopelman. I was a uh, full professor of science in the Department of Science and Mathematics at FIT for been there was there for thirty nine years. I retired back in um, in December twenty nineteen. Um, and I am, a, a, sorry, um, a, a professor emeritus now at, at FIT, the ninth in, in FIT's history. I was a SUNY Distinguished Service Professor. I am now a SUNY Distinguished Service Professor emeritus. I'm a marine mammal ecologist, um, and I've been working, looking at populations of seals and whales and dolphins and others here in Long Island for about 35 years. Yeah, it was an honor to to to, uh, to be in this course with Keith. Um, it was an honor to teach these students and all the other ones, um, and it's an honor to uh, be back to talk about it. Let's go to Megan. Yeah, we can turn over to the students. To Megan. Hi, my name is Megan Weber, and I'm a freelance photographer and scientific diver with the New York Aquarium. Um, I focus my work on trying to bring awareness to people who might not otherwise realize things that we can do to create a more sustainable world. And I try to do that through uh, images and, and tangible, tangible things that uh, people may enjoy. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Taylor Larson and I'm a recent graduate of Stony Brook University with a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Humanities. I'm currently working as an environmental educator for SeaTuck Environmental Association on Long Island. And I attended FIT my freshman year of college in 2016, 2017, where I took this course. And um, taking this course really influenced me a lot in that it helped me realize um, my interest in changing degrees to become something more environmentally focused. And so, yeah, it really solidified my interest in doing so. And I ended up transferring to Stony Brook uh, graduating this past May. And like I said, it's so happy that I'm here to talk about how this course has influenced me so much. And um, yeah, I'm just really happy to be here. It's gotten to me where, it's gotten me to where I am today. So, um, Laura, off to you. Hey all, thank you for having me. Um, so I graduated from FIT in 2018 and I took this course, I believe in 2016. Um, I absolutely loved it. Similarly to Taylor, um, I'm now at Stony Brook pursuing my master's in social work and kind of the grand scheme goal is to combine environmental um, photography with social justice and kind of meld the two worlds together for environmental and social conservation. Yeah, so excited to be here with you guys. Thank you all for your introductions. So I'd like to start uh, just by uh, having uh, Professor Ellenbogen and Kopelman to have both of each of you talk about uh, a little bit about this course. Tell us a little bit about what co what course this is. Um, why did you want to develop and teach the course? And also about the model, the the um, co teaching interdisciplinary model and how well that works for our students and for this material. I'll turn it over. Let Sorry, I th let me start for a sec. Just before when Keith's first semester, um, folks, my colleagues would come up to me and say, "Hey, this is guy Keith. You got to meet him." 
and folks are telling Keith the same thing. There's this, this guy, Artie, you got to meet him. Um, and we met, and um, I had been teaching field bio uh, for, met for decades, um, along with my ecology and environmental problems course. And I always, I had photography students, and they rarely took photographs. Um, and I went to the chairs of the photography department several times over, over the years and said, how about a wildlife photography course? And I told this to Keith. And so we both work in marine systems and, and work with photography. For me, it's research photography. Um, um, and he said, yeah, let's do it. It was that quick. And we came up with an idea. And what did it take us? A few months? Maybe? Oh, okay. Longer? I, it's a little longer. But a little longer. About, about a semester, maybe to a year to, to, to come up with this course. It was incredible. Yeah. You're so, up. so just to give it a little overview, the class that we developed was called PHSC 254, Ecology and Photography, Sustainable New York. And the overall sort of course objective or was based on a, a real world model of how science and photography work together on all these assignments that I travel on around the world to go photograph environmental fish or wherever it may be. I'm always teamed up with a leading scientist and sort of looking at that sort of intersection between what does what do we want to communicate environmentally and then how do we actually show that in a visual way that creates an emotional connection and captures the hearts of minds and of people to bring those two as an intersection together and so we took this real world application of how things work in the field and brought it into a classroom and sort of wanted to create this dynamic role of what wildlife is here in New York City and where can students go to experiment experience what are some of the real environmental challenges facing New York City an island and a place that has similar environmental challenges as other places in the world and so that was the sort of uh, beginning of our class and we developed this and set it up as an interdisciplinary interteaching to to teaching where they learned one the environmental science what is important and then two how to photograph it and how to communicate these things. And um, on that note, I think uh, it was, it's was it been one of the most exciting classes I have ever taught. And here are three of just outstanding students who um, exemplify, um, you know, sort of coming up with ideas, thinking creatively and feeling passionate about how they communicate um, um, the environment from different perspectives, some science, some photography, and you heard in their bios, the blending. So I think now's a good time to turn it over to them to sort of get a little bit of a deeper understanding of the work that they've actually produced and, and what their current trajectory is in life um, to hear their perspective. So I think we'll turn it over to Megan here um, and uh, we look forward to seeing a couple of these pictures. So a couple of the things that I think are really important for, for people is that it, it's, it's easy to preach to the choir of people who are already interested in ecology and conservation and taking care of the planet, but it's more important, I think, to reach people who might not realize that we can make a difference and, and each individual can make a difference. Um, and I think with, with beautiful imagery, you can do that. Um, you can do that with disturbing imagery, um, but I, I tend to be really interested in uh, design elements uh, as far as nature is concerned. Um, the detail uh, that we were taught to really pay attention to when we were out in the field was amazing and it really changed how I take pictures you know looking at something really closely and what's so amazing about nature is that the detail is insane um, it's far better designer than I could ever hope to be um, but it's it's things like that that I, I think people don't necessarily realize is out there. Um, if you look at the images, I've been photographing uh, the migratory birds and the local birds in the Navy Yard for the last few years. And it all started with the class. Um, you know, we went out and we saw birds that I didn't even know existed. I, I think we all think that it's just pigeons and sparrows in New York City, but it's not. But if you also look at those pigeons and sparrows, they too are detailed and beautiful. Um, and taking the time to, to do that makes a difference. Um, and I found that 
discussing this with people in the in the Navy Yard who thought everything was was just common birds, they're getting interested. And it's those people who who I'd like to be able to to reach. Um, I've been so here's some images from just our local birds. And I mean, you can see the detail in, around the eyes and the colors of, of just teeny tiny things. Um, the botanicals were images I took in the, the class, um, the symmetry of plants and, uh, and patterns in the leaves and, and petals, uh, how it relates to light and color and their responsiveness to light. It, it's just, it's stunning, and I think that we miss that sometimes in New York, and it's important to, to talk about that. But I've been working on um, a book uh, for the, the people in the Navy Yard to see this is what's right outside. So the, the center group of pictures is, a, is an ID book that I've been working on. And I think that people who, who may not realize that these things are right here in New York and we can go see them anytime we want, um, if we just open our eyes and look, I, I would find value in that. Um, what I think is interesting about COVID over the last year is that people are getting outside and they are paying attention to stuff like that. And it's, um, I've, it's really touching. Uh, people are pointing out birds to me that they're excited to see. And that really makes a difference. And I, I think with photography, you can do so many things besides just have beautiful images. Um, the first group of pictures is a, a child's uh, book that I've made with images of all uh, wildlife conservation society animals. Um, in the course, we went to the Bronx Zoo, um, where they do amazing work to conserve nature all over the world. And so this book is based on when you're young, teaching kids about the animals that are out there. Um, and then there's also, there's so many things that you can do with pictures and um, print FX. Uh, I printed some, uh, some pictures on, on um, fabric and made them into, made them into pillows. And, you know, from that, I've, people are ordering stuff like that. And what's really neat now also is that there are sustainable fabrics that are available. There are, there's a lot more than, um, used to be in the marketplace where people are paying closer attention to where we're spending our money. And I think if you, if we highlight stuff like that um, and you see these things in the marketplace, um, it can shift how people are buying or looking at things. And at least that's my hope. So, uh, and I got all of, you know, it really made a difference learning about this in the class where it's, it's like uh, one person's voice can change things. You know, um, less plastic in the world and or using those plastics that do exist and making them into fabric. It's little things like that that can really change how we live and how we protect stuff. And every single person can do that. And it's sometimes you just, you just need to talk to people about it. So that's what I've I've really gained out of this this class. Plus, I I just love the beauty of of being outdoors, and uh, I really get to appreciate it now that I've learned to to take a look at the detail of things. So, um, Taylor, would you like to show your next? Um, certainly, yeah. But before you go, Taylor, do we want to just jump in with a, a couple of questions and 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 sort of um, uh, just have a quick little dialogue here for a second about about her beautiful work? Mm -hmm. Taylor Laurel, do you have any any um, questions you want to ask her or anything or or anyone? Um, yes, uh, Megan, um, you mentioned a children's book. Did you take photographs for that children's book? I did, yeah. Um, and some of them I took their, their pictures. The the peacock image is one that I took during class. Um, but they, I went to the, at, you know, we were at the Bronx Zoo, but I went to the other uh, Wildlife Conservation Society park and and took photos. Um, so each letter of the alphabet has an animal that corresponds with it. And you know, some of them are simple animals, but I also like to introduce like Komodo. Um, Actually, one of the images is not a, a Wildlife Conservation Society 
animal. It's a Komodo dragon. Um, but, you know, when you, the, the letter K, so Komodo dragon. Um, and I think kids like that stuff. I mean, I like that stuff. Um, my niece liked that stuff. I've had a few orders for, for other books as well. And it's been a pleasure to, to really go out and see that. And the fact that we have it here, except for the Komodo dragons in New York City, is we're really lucky that that exists here and it exists in a responsible way that they take care of uh they take care of their their animals and they responsibly treat them and uh are working to working with breeding programs to to really help more endangered species that we have um so yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah i just wanted to say i really love that um being that I am an environmental educator for kids for an after school program. A lot of it is like fostering a connection with nature for like kids with nature and being a children's book with these beautiful images. Once they like something, they'll definitely start to care about it more. And if it comes along a time where maybe they have to step up, maybe sign a petition or uh, like vote for certain legislations that will protect these creatures, like things like that certainly help out. So I think that's really amazing what you're doing. I love it. Just wanted to say that I, that's amazing what you're doing as well that, <laughs> thanks for telling us about it i'll send you a copy of the book oh my god amazing <laughs> signed copy <laughs> anyone else questions or or comments or it's absolutely uh beautiful work where did you sh shoot the um aquarium looking pieces like all the fish was that out in nature or certain aquariums that was at the uh, New York. Oh, those those pictures in the pillows were um, the, the that was in Indonesia. Um, we really like Indonesia. Um, they they have they work hard to try to conserve their oceans. Um, and actually, there's an area called uh, Raja Ampat in Indonesia where a lot of divers go, and they've they're shutting it down for a few years to um, so that the the reefs can heal themselves. You know, they responsibly uh, tend to their oceans, and that's something else that's super important. And you, Laura, you're a uh, you're a surfer, right? Yep, correct. Yeah. So I mean, so you know how important it is to to protect the oceans. But yeah, those were images were taken in in uh, I think they were actually in the Rajan Pot a few years ago. That's awesome. And similarly to Taylor, um, I work with kids. I run a couple youth groups in high risk areas. Mm -hmm. And like the number one thing for the past year is just getting them out into nature. And whether it's like a flower in like a cracked uh, sidewalk, just getting kids especially stoked on that is awesome. So the fact that you have a book out, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. Megan, I'd like to ask a question um, of you. Your work's really beautiful, and the birds that you took photos of, they're all really dynamic photos. I mean, in some ways, we take them for granted, but the bird's sort of in flight. It's got a, a body language that seems really interesting. And you seem like you have access to places. Can you just talk a little bit about, like, the patients involved, the photo making process? You know, sometimes people just think you're there and you capture a picture, but can you talk a little bit about what has been involved in the images that we just see those six and then the 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 book that you've made just to give us a sense of the work and the time that's that's taking you to, to capture these and uh, process would be great. That's that's such a great question because I don't think about it because I enjoy it for the for the most part, but you know, it's it is hours and hours and hours of practice and hoping and and there's one image I've been trying to get a flicker for four years and they don't come to the Navy Yard very often and their the design of, of these birds it's just incredible what they I, the intricate different spots and colors and the, the way when they move their wings the, that you see something different and fish are like that too actually which is another reason why I love fish so much but the the time spent to try to get this one bird is, I mean, I don't want to think about it. I, it, I would be losing money if I actually thought about the, the amount of time. And at the same time, it's interesting, even if I miss it, to see how they react, how they interact with each other. I, um, we have a lot of mockingbirds this time of year, 
and they'll actually mock the shutter of the camera. And they're so loud and it's like they're they're sort of the obnoxious neighbor and you can see how uh, they'll try to kick out the the robins. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. At the same time, all that time spent also in not the best conditions a lot of the time because you also don't want to be seen uh, if you want to get some good shots and you need a really long lens. And um, it's, I love my trans thought, but it's, it's, for me, it's been worth it to do it, but it certainly is not, is, I, it's, you got to be really, really lucky to get something uh, uh, just out of the gate. It's, it's time consuming and it's a lot of learning. Something that actually you taught us in class was uh, and you know when I when you're shooting birds you have to use if you want a certain look it has to be a really fast shutter speed you have to be able to track it and um, but if you want to be able to create some movement in in the wings that's a whole different thing and you had taught me about it, paying attention to the way the wind hits uh, some of the grasses that we saw in Jamaica Bay. And those are those images I would never have done because you know you, you think it's supposed to be a certain thing that it's it's a clear crisp picture. But what makes something more interesting is if you actually when something is two dimensional but you can see movement in it at the same time. I mean that that was something I got from class that I really I try to do with the birds and it's it's super hard but it's it's also to to try to practice that stuff. Yeah. Well, your you pictures are beautiful. Know, and out it, it, it's probably the same with you with, with underwater. I mean, it must take forever to get some of the, the shots that you I mean, waiting, waiting for the right get. moment. Waiting for the right moment is so difficult. And I appreciate these. And, you know, birders spend lifetimes looking for waiting for the right call, a bird to come into sight. And so, you know, it's a labor <laughs> of love, but it's also an art of patience to be able to know to position yourself there. And I, would just say that I think that, yes, there's an element of luck, but only luck for those who are prepared. Um, if you don't have your camera, or don't know to be there, you can't be lucky for those moments. So I think that a lot of the time spent, I can see coming through there. So really beautiful work um, out there. I think just uh, maybe we'll Thank move you. over to the next one. Um, and I guess that's Taylor. Um, okay, can everyone see this image? Yes. Okay. So I wanted to share this image today and talk about it because it is one of my favorite locations that we went to as a class. We took the ferry, I believe, um, through New York Harbor to Swinburne Island where we, um, we were watching seals. Now, if you could see kind of almost in the center of the photograph above these rocks, you'll see a seal spy hopping. Artie, I believe you mentioned that term today and it was looking, trying to see on the other side of the rocks for whatever reason, I'm not sure. You could chime in if you want to explain that. But um, yeah, this was definitely a um, like a transformative experience in that I never, growing up on Long Island, um, I never knew we had seals here. So this was really a change, changing moment for me. And everyone I told, like from that moment on, like, oh my gosh, I saw seals today in the New York Harbor. Did you know there were seals here? Like. No one knew and um, I would show them these photographs. They thought it was amazing. And yeah, another really great takeaway from this particular trip, but also the class as a whole was how photography and imagery can be a great tool of communication and showing people that yes, there is life in these, what I otherwise thought was a lifeless body of water being like a New York Harbor. It's polluted, right? It looks mucky, but no, there's actually life here. and. Yeah, so that also influenced what kind of environmental program I wanted to go into. Stony, I, like I said, mentioned before, I transferred to Stony Brook. Um, they have like a plethora of environmental programs, but I decided to do environmental humanities because I definitely saw a gap between people's knowledge of environmental issues and the issues themselves, the lack of connection, how people are contributing to these and wildlife such as seals that are being affected uh, by such things. And so environmental humanities definitely encompasses a lot of scientific uh, communication. I definitely went the route of writing, um, a lot of like writing, perhaps uh, perhaps I'll become, do some sort of like article writing one day and definitely photography goes hand in hand in that. 
adding imagery to my uh, scientific writing and communication with that. And um, yeah, so this particular trip and image was very influential to me and uh, definitely life-changing uh, for sure, to say the least. And um, as I mentioned, um, going to Stony Brook, I had the great opportunity to study abroad for a semester, five months. Um, I went to New Zealand and part of that, I was able to travel the, the country, of course. And this particular area is called Mermaid Pools. Um, very beautiful, as you could see. However, what you don't see is that this is a, actually a very unhealthy pool. There is no life in it. And you can see tourists are going to go swim in it, which actually locals um, advise you not to do. The local um, indigenous group, uh, Maori people, they have actually completely closed off, since I have traveled to New Zealand, they have completely closed off any form of visitation um, to these pools in an attempt to allow it time to heal and recover and to prevent people from entering these pools because the main issue is affecting the water quality, such as like when you put sunscreen on, for example, and it goes off, comes off into the water, it'll have a detrimental effect on anything living there. Um, and obviously that has happened here. Um, one reason this area has become so popular is because of like Instagram, uh, like media and attention because it's such a beautiful site. That's certainly how I found out about it. Um, so when I went there, I didn't want to go be a part of this issue, contribute to this issue. So instead I chose to take a photo of this in order to talk about this issue and raise awareness for, yes, this is a beautiful place, but we should be able to respect it and uh, respect the indigenous peoples um, like reasoning for uh, protecting this. The Māori people, they consider themselves um, kaitiaki, which are environmental stewards. The way in which they are protecting these pools is called kaiti katango, which is environmental stewardship. And it all, everywhere you go in uh, New Zealand, it is definitely an environmentally conscious uh, country in terms of um, legislation, but also um, Anywhere you go, if you order takeout, it'll be bamboo cutlery and compostable packaging and everything like that. Their um, transportation sector is uh, in a, it's being transformed. They just released new legislation, I believe, or goals to um, you know cut down on their carbon emissions. And so it's a very serious country. So this um, going to these mermaid pools, learning about what the indigenous people um, are trying to do to protect it, and seeing how um, just everyone cares about the natural beauty of um, their home it was really influential to me. Uh, definitely a big takeaway from this. And being able to photograph this and share it all with you today certainly is part of that scientific communication that I'm trying to bring with me throughout my studies and travels. And going on to my last image, this was also taken in New Zealand. This was, um, the mermaid pools were more north on the North Island. Um, this is in the middle of the South Island. Very remote place, I would have to say. It's in a town called Wanaka. And this tree attracts thousands of visitors each year. It's the most photographed tree in New Zealand. As you can see, it's very beautiful. Um, it certainly made me want to go and see it. It's it's quite an experience. You have to you have to drive maybe like two or three hours just to go and photograph this one tree. And I'm I wasn't the only one who wanted to do it. If I were to um pull back the frame along the banks of the, the lake, you would see maybe like clusters of people, groups of 50 or so people trying to take a picture with this one tree. And that was a really amazing thing to see. Um, this connection between people and nature um, was really amazing. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I do believe this tree has had some sort of, um, I think it looks different today. I think someone actually has damaged it unfortunately I'll have to I'll have to um look more into that but yeah I'll, what I really wanted to say about this image was that it was really quite amazing seeing how just one single tree can attract a lot of people make them care about this one certain place um so much so that they'll travel to it for a few hours just to spend maybe a half hour taking pictures with it or of it 
I think I even saw someone taking their wedding photos with it in the background, which was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, that was a pretty um, incredible experience for sure and definitely worth the visit. Um, and as you can see before, I, believe, I have it as my uh, my desktop background. It's just a really great memory. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are all the images I wanted to share with you today. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed them. Thank you. Great. Uh, they're Thank absolutely you, beautiful. Beautiful. Artie, thank Sorry, you okay. for, for telling us about your experience. And, and, and Megan, thank you as well. I guess it's time for uh, any anyone else have questions, comments? Laura, are you ready? I have oh, a I have couple questions. of questions. I want to ask. Okay, go ahead. Daniel. Yeah, so um, that image is stunning and it, it almost looks like, you know, there's some sort of photographic trick going on here. There can't be a tree growing out of the middle of a lake or wherever. I'm not familiar with the topography where you were, mm -hmm. but I, it just speaks so much in terms of, uh, you know, things that we think of resilience and the resilience of nature. Um, and so I was just, you know, I, I'm really, I think, moved by the way that your photographs do communicate about environmental issues. And I'm wondering, you know, what maybe what your plans are in the future to do that, to use your, your skill, you have obvious photographic talent and skill to communicate these issues because that's a big challenge, right? We have to um, share with people what's going on around the world and who's being impacted and bring it home for them and, and make them feel it. And photos are powerful, a powerful way to do that. So I just wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate everything you said. I'm really happy you I got that effect from those photographs. And I wanted to say, actually, I've looked more into that tree and it is actually a symbol of hope. So um, being that it, you know, grows out of this, um, this beautiful lake seems unnatural, right? So it's quite incredible. Um, but yeah, like, um, I do. Well, what I want to say is that when I first started getting interested in environmental issues, looking at National Geographic like uh, photographs or conservation photography, that was really um, transformative in me, definitely uh, inspired me as well. When I first saw that this course was offered, I immediately signed up for it because it uh, had such an impact on me on wanting to communicate these uh, issues because what these conservation photographers are doing, um, what their images made me feel is what I want to do as well. Um, like I said, um, in my studies, I've become, uh, I would like to say, like I consider myself a writer. Um, if I were to be some sort of science uh, communicator writing articles on um, environmental issues and accompanying them with photography to um, not, it, I, I do believe that imagery also is a great tool and that um, it helps to see something, uh, not only just read about it, but if you see it up front, maybe if you see an image of something that you live near that you've never seen before, for example, like the, the harbor seals, uh, it'll really just uh, hit home more. So um, I do hope in my future that I will be um, an effective um, communicator of these environmental issues through writing and imagery and photography. Mm. Uh, I really like that you. That's wonderful. Oh, sorry, Keith. Thank no, you. no, no, Megan, you go ahead, please. I really like that you uh, learned about the the uh, indigenous people in, in New Zealand and the story, backstory that that's that was an incredible story. Thank you. Um, and it's something that I, I hope that one day in this country we will will be as conscious about about things and stories like that. I think are really encouraging. It's really great work. And same with me with the seals. I I knew we had whales that returned, uh, but the seals, I just couldn't believe it. It's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, could you take your kids that you work with to go see them one day? Do you, um, do I don't know. Are you will you be a, they have, know about it? Actually, some of the kids from from the school, Little Peepers, um, at 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 South Shore Nature Center. It's a school my wife helped to set up. This is a the small world that we have, um, and we, we did do a couple of seal walks out. At my study site with, with those kids um, for a few years, and it was stopped by the pandemic. But um, yeah, anytime you want, you just right. get in touch. We'll do it. <laughs> Sounds good. Great. Great. I, I have a couple of questions for you. 
Um, how is it that do you think, first of all, you described things. I have two questions for you. The first is you described the fact that you were surprised that there are seals in New York. And can you, but we understand in language that seals are in New York. And can you talk a little bit about the language differences between visual storytelling, your picture, and the seal in there? And at first glance, I saw the picture and I didn't really see the seal at the very first. And when you pointed it out to me, the picture became a thousand times more compelling. And this is where words and images to me complement one another because now I'm, I'm so curious. And you then describe about wanting to write about it and communicate and people don't know and even in an auditory way. Can you just describe a little bit about this combination between storytelling and maybe how they complement and they're different um, and what the things are you look for uh, in that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... Well, when you're uh, asking me that question, first thought that comes to mind is seeing is believing. I know that's a little cliche, but um, um, I do think that, I guess the experience of going to photograph things for me, going to see things in person, um, I have gotten that want and um, like desire to go travel and see these places um, from looking at images of other uh, from other people and of things like amazing things like um, seals in New York Harbor. And so in terms of like a, a combination, um, I guess imagery and photography has its strengths um, and writing does as well. And in terms of them complementing, they'll obviously pick up each other's like uh, where they're lacking. I think you can read about something and imagine what it's like, but when you actually see a photograph, you know it's real and you um, can actually, uh, I guess without like um, just assuming what, it, what it's like, you can see the real thing for itself. Um, I don't know if I can like uh, completely answer your question fully just because I do believe um, it's something I'm still discovering for myself and trying to work on as a scientific communicator. Um, um, I think you answered it really beautifully. And I oh, would wonder, and you don't have to answer this now, but if you were to write a scientific or an environmental piece on harbor seals, what image would capture what you want to show there and vice versa, what language or what would you want to say that would be in words that the picture that would can't communicate in in a single picture or, or would be very difficult maybe? Okay, um, uh, yeah, I guess one of my favorite uh, skills or uh, things that I was really enjoying experimenting while photographing um, in this course was the kind of like this contrast between like nature and then maybe having things in like a city backdrop. So yeah. I know, um, and the Swinburne um, image, I was trying to decide a couple different ones I wanted to choose, and one of them had Coney Island in the background, and I thought that contrast was really, really cool. So if I were to go back and do this, um, I do believe um, maybe an image with the city, like from a different, taken from a different angle with like the city mm -hmm. or a bridge in the background would definitely um, show, I guess, and then also in terms of words, like our neighbors or we share um, seals live in this harbor too or something like that like um it's not just us here um it's not just us like in, in terms of me but like a, it's more of a collective versus like um uh, this doesn't belong here it's all ours type of thing mm -hmm. it's a beautiful they were here first <laughs> yeah they were here first I, I was gonna say it's such a, a poetic answer or something and i think that's in my own photography is one of the things that i think is uh, great, you see something once, and then you realize, oh my God, this can happen. Maybe you didn't get the shot, maybe you saw it and the boat was moving and now you realize, oh, I wanna go back and that is the image I wanna make. And I think that is the real distinction between just taking a picture and making one is the artistry in that. And I think you couldn't have articulated it any better if I would have wanted to. And so very nice on Thank that. You. Um, I think Thank we you. better move on to to the next person. Um, beautiful work. Um, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and we should probably uh, pass it on to Laura. Sure. So, um, as Megan mentioned earlier, I am a surfer. 
um, Keith actually told me about the Nikonis camera, um, I believe my freshman year of college, and I went out right after and bought it. It's an underwater 35 millimeter camera, and I think I took it with me every day, <laughs> everywhere I went. It's a great camera, but um, it's so fun to shoot while I surf. Um, and I entered school thinking I wanted to be a photojournalist and shoot uh, war photography. And after four years of school and growing, I really realized I just like to make beautiful images and tell a story through that and raise awareness for causes but the images themselves are abstract and beautiful in themselves. So here's a couple of them. This is looking down um, at a, it's a rock at the bottom, but it's a little bit blurry. It was a slower shutter. Um, then here's a close up of uh, some sea foam. I love just playing around with um, kind of different perspectives. You know, when you're out in the water, it's easy to just like look at the horizon and that's all you see. But um, just trying to see one subject in as many different um, lenses or viewpoints as I can has really been a passion of mine for the past few years now. And I play around with different film. So the colors are obviously a little bit different. Um, it's just so I feel like every day the water has a different uh, energy and just a totally different feel. Some days it's crazy, there's a storm coming in, and then other days it's like this. It's just totally peaceful. So capturing images throughout the month and looking back and seeing how much uh, weather plays a part in how nature changes has really been a fun thing to play around with. And then uh, similarly to Taylor, it's interesting the conjunction of men and nature. So when you're out in the water, um, I'm typically looking out at the horizon, but then you turn around and see a city right behind you. Um, it's kind of crazy how quickly when you're in the city, you forget nature. And when you're in nature, you can forget the city. So it's a fun thing to think about. And that's my uh, last one. Oh, that's my last one. <laughs> <laughs> really beautiful. Um, very, very nice. Comments, anyone? Laura, where did you take that um, the picture with the architecture in the in the background? That was in uh, Long Beach. I was going to okay. guess Long Beach. Did you see any whales that day? I didn't. I do see them often out there, though. And dolphins, actually. Um, mm -hmm. A couple months ago, well, I guess in the fall, I was surfing and literally three dolphins just like surfed in the wave with me all the way in. It's crazy. You don't think about that right here, but there's, there's life. They're there. They're I love how that harbor. image. Sorry. I love how your image has the, uh, the ocean is is sort of blending in with the sky. It, it, you've got clouds there and they're all sort of put together. And then, you know, with architecture, and I love it. It's, it's really, it's really stunning. Thank all you. the, all your work is really beautiful. Well, that was really jarring and, stu and stunning. Thank Thanks you for sharing it. Yeah, I really think your work is very beautiful. When I first saw everyone putting their work up on the, the Google Drive, I was like, oh my gosh, like these people are amazing, like <laughs> compared to some of my photographs. But um, yeah, really amazing stuff. Thank you. Laura, Laura did, I'm trying to remember, I think, weren't you when you took the course sort of trying to photograph ice in various yeah. places? I was actually. I mean, yeah. Was I like the uh, kind of micro worlds, um, whether that be like a close up of a wave or ice or really anything, just like zoning in on a subject. And similarly to the water, I mean, ice looks different everywhere you go, like every block is different. So I think it's so quick um, as society, we just are like, okay, we're at the beach or like, 
or somewhere mm. snowy, but it's everywhere is always different and paying attention to that is pretty beautiful. Would you have had a chance to do that in any other course that you took at FIT? No, absolutely not. I mean, even just getting to go outside was phenomenal. A lot of the coursework at FIT is really studio based and um, tech heavy and like lighting equipment heavy. So just having a course that we were able to just explore the natural environment and create beautiful work without all of the equipment um, and bringing lights around was great. It was a phenomenal opportunity. Can Can I ask Megan a question? To tweak your memory for yes. a second. Do you remember yeah. the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens? And yes. The, the being there for the um, the the um the cherry blossom and your reaction to seeing that for the first time <laughs> i was i mean i it probably brought tears to my eyes because it did indeed it's something yes. i've wanted to see my whole life i could i and i've been here for you know 25 years and i never went to see them until this until this class like it, like with Laura, I, all the photo I, and I think you know studio work is interesting and I and I like all of that, but it was so great to be out and really see these. I mean, that was a real treasure, the cherry blossoms. I thought you had to go to Japan to see that. Yeah. I mean, it was it was You're really 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 beautiful. <laughs> great, thank you, uh, Laura. Just I have two quick questions for you. One. Um, you mentioned an Iconis Vibe um, camera, but I don't think the majority of the audience would even know where to begin with what that is. Maybe just for one second, can you just clarify what that what that camera is? Yeah, sorry. Um, so it's a 35 millimeter underwater camera. Um, Jack Cousteau actually used it, which is pretty cool. Um, it was the first camera to be allowed to take uh, medical photos in surgery because you can since it's completely waterproof, you can like alcohol wipe the whole thing down. Um, so it's been around for a while. Uh, it's a great like sturdy camera. And again, it's 35 millimeter, so. It's and can you, just, can you just briefly mention the focus on that is very different to a focus we're used to today. Can you just talk about how that helps you out and, and what that process is? Sure, I'm, so it's, um, it's like an adjustment knob. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a manual it's focus. Good. It's a yeah. manual focus, but you don't look through the lens and see the focus. You have to set the distance to subject and the aperture. So you set what you think your focal range will be. I, that is to say, I'm six feet away. And so you guesstimate your distance on that focus. Is that right? That is correct. And then the viewfinder itself um, isn't actually uh, through the lens. So you're kind of you have to know that if you want to look through the viewfinder, you're looking two inches above what you're shooting. Yeah. And how did that camera use it? I mean, nowadays we're in this modern world where it's snap, 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 we're here, we take a picture. But how did using that uh, camera, a more traditional film camera, influence your photography and art making and sort of storytelling? Can you uh, just describe that? Yeah, I love uh, film to be begin with. I just love how much slower of a process it is especially now when everything is so quick um if i have 28 frames on a roll i'm not going to go out there and shoot it all as quick as i can so maybe i take two images and then go surf for an hour and then the tide has changed and i'm like i can take two more um so it really slows me down but beyond that it's just so exciting Right now, I don't have anywhere to process myself. I go to a shop to process my film. So it's great on a day that the waves are bad. I can take four rolls of film to a shop, process it. And it's like a true gift when I get my film back and see like which images are greater that I love. Whereas if I just came home and plugged in a SD card of 500 images, it's it's great. You have phenomenal work, but it's a totally different field than like this special, unique moment. And just as a very last quick question before we go to the group, can you just talk about you're a surfer? You like the environment. You like the ocean. Can you just talk about like, how do you choose the moment you chose a few pictures of like a wave 
a, a horizon. You know, picking a wave is never an easy experience, right? You wait for that one moment. Can you just talk about like what is your process? This beautiful way of like artistry of, of capturing. Can you just talk about what what are the elements that work for you to be able to communicate the environment and that the ocean kind of feel um, to capture that? Sure. So um, it's definitely a mixture. There's days that I would love to be shooting and the waves are so good that I'd prefer to be surfing. So there's this constant like battle between the two. Um, but when I do bring my camera out, I'm usually sitting on my board and just waiting or playing around swimming. Um, since it is waterproof, I can just wait out there as long as I want for an image. Um, and I just stare at the water as I guess similarly to Megan with the birds, you're just staring and I just wait and maybe it'll be the way that waves start rolling. And since I surf, I know when a bigger wave is gonna come maybe like a 45 seconds in advance. So maybe there's a ripple that is gonna be within my viewfinder in 20 seconds. So I'll wait and get in the position that I want for that. But just a lot of waiting and watching which goes hand in hand then with surfing. I'm a better surfer because I've stared at the waves for so many hours, but. Really nice. Beautiful. Yeah, so we have, we have a few minutes left if we wanna um, have some, some final points, make some final points. And uh, one question that came up for me um, is, Kind of what you know since we're this course you were embedded in new york and new york as as you've mentioned several of you have mentioned is not where you don't think of wildlife photography in new york city you think of other kinds of photography um and so i'm just wondering what kinds of um surprises number one you had and uh, we've already heard a few of those but also how did this you know the the assignments in this course and and you know just the, the structure of it how did it reveal environmental problems to you if it did I don't know, maybe it didn't. I think what stands out to me would be the trip that we did to the Bronx Zoo. Um, they are a conservation, so it's not like they were taking, they were taking animals that um, wouldn't have survived in the wild, but it was really, um, the polar bear the day that we went there just was not happy he was really sad and it's like an image that has stuck in my head um i think on a larger scale just how we interact with the world around us and how we interact with animals really needs to change um i'm not saying that they were doing anything wrong to the polar bear um but just seeing how in a rush everyone around New York City is and then like there's this small little plot of land where all these beautiful animals are um we as a society can learn a lot from that thank you wonderfully said others were there locations that you liked that you we went to that were surprised you like Jamaica Bay or Central Park or um that you know caught you off guard for some of the life there or environmental issues um yeah i would say that um central park was definitely um one that sticks out to me because it's somewhere that i've been to many times but going there as a class and viewing it as kind of like this escape from the city also it felt that way too having like i was living on campus in the city all day every day and then not and then going to Central Park, but experiencing it differently for like the first time as this, like I said, an escape kind of like a, a break from all these like city skyscrapers and uh, the bustling noises of everything and then seeing um, like geese in in the, in the water or birds flying around um, and not just pigeons, uh, for example. Um, and I think we talked about that as a class uh, as well, um, how it's amazing that in this huge metropolis of a city, there is um, such a huge amount of space designated um, for, for uh, nature to thrive in the form of Central Park. So, um, 
yeah, even though that's not really like an environmental issue, if anything, it, it showcases how important nature is and that we should care about these issues. Um, it's Central Park definitely shows that nature is a necessity for sure. And that's one thing that I, I got from going there as with the class. Great. Well said, well said. Thank you, Taylor. If you were just to say, um, what about this class would would be like the lasting memory? Like if you if someone says like, well, what what did you really love about this class? What would you I mean, I don't want to put love in your words, but what would you what would you you uh, um, how would you describe, you know, that? I mean, you all have a, a passion and sort of move forward. What what do you think helped along the way to facilitate that? I feel like it was a breath of fresh air to. Um be able to number one shoot what we want so you would take us to a destination but then we were able to photograph what we wanted to and what we were passionate about um so having that open perspective was just really great in an otherwise very uh rigid photography formatted program that i was in i thought it was great and it let me explore that and understand that it's okay that i just really love shooting the ocean. You know, I don't have to be a studio photographer. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, that's a good, a good point. It, um, I figured out the kind of photographer I wanted to be from this class. You know, there's a, a studio work is, is, is interesting and learning how, how light works is, is really important, but it was, I didn't know the type of photographer I wanted to be. And I, figured it out from from doing this class. I, I know that we I can make images that can mean more than just a it can be just more than just a pretty picture. And and I it's brought more meaning to my life to to think of it in those terms. I mean I, I love beautiful images, but I, I also love the idea that there's something more behind it. And I think it's fascinating nature and an urban environment period. I think it's really, really interesting. And New York is pretty decent at, at uh, having green spaces. Um, but I, I like to see the, how we can coexist together through, through photos. I think it's a really interesting thing that I never really explored before, but I got that from the class. I got a lot out of the class, period. I think that is an excellent point to end on. I think that is that kind of sums it up. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you to all, all of you. Thank you to um, the students for coming back and participating in this and sharing your experiences and your photos. Um, it's really brilliant work. And thanks to our brilliant faculty as well um, for um, offering a class like this and sharing your talents. Um, so I think that's a wrap. You're welcome. This, this class was always a joy. This was fun. Um, for them, I'm sure, but for us, it was special and it was, it was fun. I loved it. And thank you all for, um, telling us about how well we did in terms of, uh, affecting things and see how well you did in terms of moving forward and making differences. That's the idea behind education. Yeah.